they produce seven, 10, 12, 20 different narratives regarding the same event. They are using truth, like truthful information, a lot of fake, and blend it into the story which influences emotions of people. It's all an integrated operation that aligns up underneath a combined arms approach. Today we're going to talk about, frankly, one of the most um, insidious and effective uh, weapons of war, and that is propaganda. Propaganda is not new. Um, it goes by many names. It's been around for thousands of years. Um, but new technologies have made information operations both more effective but also more vulnerable. So we're going to talk about both those elements. I want to just start with a little bit of context. Talk to us about uh, what is known in the, in the uh, security industry as PSYOPs in war. How was propaganda deployed as a weapon of war and why? So the, <clears throat> the joke I've made in the past is um, effectively propaganda, disinformation, shaping the thoughts of leadership and the people is one of the oldest professions in the world. It's the third oldest profession as I see it. The second being intelligence. And really all um, a propaganda effort is, is an extension of an intelligence operation. And we talked, yes, well, we all know what the first oldest profession is. But, and, and honestly, they're probably all related. They could be sequentially related, but nonetheless. So we talked yesterday about how cyber is, um, is, again, simply just an extension of an intelligence operation. The way that the Russian military, particularly the GRU, but also some of their other intelligence or security services think about technology and they think about information, they don't stovepipe it like we do here. We talk about cyber, cyber, cyber. The Russians, the, the word cybersecurity does not exist effectively in the security parlance of the Russians. They view it as information, information technical and information psychological. It's all an integrated operation that aligns up underneath a combined arms approach. And so while we you know, chase rabbit holes around attacks on uh, critical infrastructure, you should be looking at um, a cyber attack, not necessarily just, for instance, as the, the physical effect or the outcome of that attack, but what's the psychological impact of a cyber attack. And that's where we were looking, particularly for 2020, as we got closer to the end of, of the election, uh, of the, the run-up to the election, I wasn't as concerned, frankly, about an actual Russian operation that was able to reach in and touch an election uh, system, because the defenses that were layered around it. What I was more worried about, frankly, was someone coming in and claiming they had done something or they had uh, attributed some sort of technical disruption to an effective operation that would then undermine the confidence in the process. We're seeing similar sorts of activities right now, uh, and in fact has been running for months and months and months in Ukraine where the Russians are attempting to seed doubt. They're trying to undermine confidence. They're trying to undermine the legitimacy of Zelensky and the Ukrainian, frankly, as even a country the legitimacy of Ukraine. They're trying to uh, undermine the legitimacy of the United States in supporting uh, Ukraine. So what they're looking to do, again, is to distract, to confuse. The intent is never to actually establish a single proof point. It's just to continue to uh, raise doubts, raise questions in the minds of the observers and those that ultimately support uh, whatever the, the national effort is. Raising that right, doubt and trust are incredibly effective weapons, and the Russians are very good at deploying propaganda, but not always. <laughs> so, Christo, I want you to talk a little bit about what you're seeing today in terms of um, the kind of uh, mis- and disinformation that uh, Russia is deploying um, about Ukraine and, uh, and, and also some of the incredible work that you've done being able to de debunk some of their claims. First, I would um, jump off of what Chris said, um, that Russia sees uh, this information essentially as a psychological game, as a psychological warfare. Every single entity in Russia, every single intelligence agency, security agency, uh, have their own department producing fake information during peacetime. Now, during wartime, this is the prerogative of the GRU. So GRU, uh, the military intelligence, they have a, the final say over what kind of false narratives are being fed out there. There's a whole 
um, faculty at the military academies throughout Russia uh, that is called uh, Faculty for or Department for Sp uh, Special um, Propaganda, Special Information Propaganda, which is essentially psychological operations. And all of these people are currently engaged with, um, with uh, setting up the narratives that are being spread out. Now, um, uh, and, and, and what the narratives are have changed uh, as a strategy over the years, because in the past, they were very good at creating one alternative explanation for everything, one fake alternative narrative. What has happened over the last six to seven years, which is partially a product of many debunking organizations appearing like Bellingcat, um, but also the technology changing completely and allowing people direct access to the raw uh, material and, and being able to see for themselves. That whole approach has changed into uh, what many scientists call the, uh, uh, the firehose of this information, which means uh, a number of different alternative theories and narratives are going out. Uh, we call it sort of the disinformation multiverse. It's essentially a um, whack-a-mole game that they, they create. They, they produce seven, 10, 12, 20 different narratives regarding the same event. And it makes it very difficult to debunk it because the moment you debunk one version of the events, then here goes another version of the events. Let, let's take what happened, uh, we'll, we'll take two examples. One is what happened with the downing of Malaysian airliner um, MH17 in 2014. That's when the Russian military intelligence perfected this fire hose technology of disinformation. Instead of producing one, for those of you who don't remember or don't know it, it was an airline with 298 passengers that was shot down over eastern Ukraine by, as we proved, and, and the uh, court um, or the prosecution in the Netherlands has proven, by a Russian missile. Uh, instead of Russia at that point coming up with one alternative narrative saying it wasn't a Russian missile, it was a Ukrainian missile, they came up with a total of, we counted up to the time that it became 19 alternative narratives. That included, uh, it was a Russian, it was a Ukrainian missile, it was a, um, uh, a, 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 it was a, um, a Mossad operation, it was a Ukrainian plane, a Ukrainian fighter plane, it was a Ukrainian uh, missile that tried to shoot down President Putin's plane, that was, who, which was flying about uh, a thousand miles away. Um, and then there was an alternative theory that the plane was actually pre-filled with dead bodies and it was just a setup, a false flag operation, and so on and so forth, up to the final uh, version that they came up with um, in one source, which was, yes, we did shoot it down, but it was a provocatia. It was a Ukrainian setup so that we would shoot at the wrong plane. So when they come up with 19 narratives, you as a media organization, as a debunker, as a, as, a, as a consumer of news. You just don't know how to process that. And that's a very, very smart strategy. Let's jump to what happened yesterday, or, or the last couple of days, the Kremenchuk uh, bombing or shelling by uh, U a Russian missile. Russia came up with six alternative, mutually exclusive, and incompatible narratives. First, they said, Lavrov came up and said that um, we didn't shoot at that location at all. Then another government official came up and said, we shot at that location, but we shot at a arms depot that was provided by the Americans. And uh, a third alternative version was that, yes, we hit the, um, the, um, the uh, commercial center, the, the shopping mall, but it was a shopping mall converted into a depot, and so on and so forth and so forth. So we had to come up with a very, very long piece yesterday uh, that, that we just published, where we debunk each of these alternative claims, but it takes time, it takes effort, it's a whack-a-mole, and that's, that's why that strategy actually works for them. So trust, uh, doubt, and sowing mistrust. Yulia, you, of course, uh, live in Kyiv. Um, you experienced everything that was happening leading up to the war, left, fled uh, Ukraine, but are still, your husband is there, you're very tied to it. Talk about how this affects you, how this kind of fog of, you know, nonsense, honestly, coming out of Russia affects uh, Ukrainians. Thank you. So just to conclude and maybe jump up what just gentlemen mentioned. So how this propaganda is working? So truth is relevant. So they are using truth, like truthful information, a lot of fake, and blend it into the story which influence emotions of people. So then, like people who are like a target of this propaganda, they start to be emotional about it. It could be hate, it could be anger, it could be adoration. So what is really matters is a narrative. 
And this narrative, or uh, like dozens of narratives, are repeating all the time, all the time, all the time. So the audience feel like, like in a warm bath, you know, like feeling the same story. And uh, like talking about Ukraine, um, like my colleagues already mentioned this, like narratives which are like sometimes like surreal for us, but they are like quite well perceived and supported in Russia. And like two points I want to make here, like it's very dangerous for us, like I'm, I'm talking like civilized democracies, uh, to be maybe not too conscious about this propaganda because like we see like, for instance, the Kim narrative most striking is that Ukraine shouldn't exist. It's not existed. It was uh, artificially created by Lenin. Imagine you wake up in the morning and somebody said like, you know, United States doesn't exist. Like it's not a, like a country like um, Hitler or whatever Stalin founded it. Like it's, it's a mistake. Come on, how could it happen? So it's such an absurd that we like think, okay, it's propaganda. But then they are really working smart. So they are combining this truthful information, this fake information, creating new and new narratives. And we need to be like very conscious, very like, like, like uh, ready to fight like each moment. So talking about Ukrainian narrative, so this one is the most striking. Like, you know, I am exist. My family exists, like my relatives exist we, for many, many times. And uh, it's interesting how it's like changing all the time. They have this key narrative we see, like before 2014 and before this Crimea invasion. And it was like Ukraine is a failed state. It shouldn't exist. Like we should like go and like help them. We need to learn them how to leave. Then it switched to this neo-Nazi. And what is interesting thing, and I have a quote here, uh, I found, which I think it's really, very, really very relevant. You remember Orwell's war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. And I think it's so important to recognize that big part of propaganda is, is replacing of meanings of like already well-known uh, like things. So we are not talking about war. They are not talking about war. They're talking about conflict. They, they are not talking about killing Ukrainians. They are talking about like liberation and like uh, Nazi liberation. Um, and there are a lot of things like that. They, they call Nazi a person, and it's like in their like, like ideological documents cited, a person who don't want to transfer the sovereignty of his own, her own country to Russia. So it means neo-Nazi today. So, and that's, that's a very like, you know, it's a very dangerous, it's a very important topic to talk to, to, talk to today. So I do believe that propaganda is uh, definitely like key weapon which Russia use. And like being here for a few days, like and talking to different people, like who are open-minded. But sometimes I receive the questions which are just like, 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 pain me because it's like exact like propaganda which is going on here and we need to be very certain and we have a hero here who's doing like a lot of like real like on the ground work but we we need to to to, to mention the budgeted budgets which are investing like which were invested for propaganda last like 20 years and we need to count people who work for russia today channels in berlin here in latin america it's huge I want to talk about actually uh, the propaganda from uh, th that affects the Russian people. Also, some propaganda coming out of the. Uh, wait, 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 I'm using the term propaganda, which generally is derisive, but some information that came uh, actually from the White House in the lead up to the war, which was part of sort of the influence operations. But first, I want to just stick with what's happening on the ground in Ukraine for a second and ask you a follow-up question, Yulia. I, I would. It seems to us from where we're sitting that to be uh, for the Russians to say you don't exist as a country, uh, that your president is a Nazi, uh, who, who ironically a Jew, the country is full of Nazis, that, that, uh, that had, has had the effect of sort of almost uh, hardening the spines, not that they needed to, of Ukrainians against Russia. And what we've been interesting, I want you to talk a little bit about is some of the, um, some of the I, I almost want to call them memes that uh, have come out of Ukraine that are also sort of counter influence operations. I'm talking specifically about the, uh, you know, the the uh, the downing of the uh, the the Russian ship, 
um, and also, you know, whether it's true or not, it, it may be apocryphal, of uh, the Ukrainian grandmother who gave the sunflower seeds to the Russian soldier and said, put these in your pocket so when you are killed, the, the, uh, the sunflowers will grow out of the ground. The so babushka about, de la muerta. Yeah, yeah. So talk about a little bit about that for a minute, and then I'll uh, let it come to you. Thank it. you for this question. Uh, indeed, like, a sense of humor is our big strength. A number of memes we like produced during this four very difficult months of this cruel war is enormous, a lot of them, and that was give us like you know it's 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 help us to be resilient and uh, yeah, absolutely absolutely sure this propaganda launched by Putin and like Russia and Russians it it helped us to mobilize. So, like, what we saw, like, all this, like, I would not say, like, uh, I would say it's, like, informational campaign, or I would say it, like, uh, creative stories and messes, which were born during the war. It's all grassroots initiatives. So it's not somebody in the cabinet who was thinking, oh, which message we should, like, put into, like, uh, into society so they, like, feel, like, uh, whatever. No, it's people, like, who are fighting. Each of us stood, stood up, like, and you know our like uh, idea is to like do something. You just need to do every day do something to win the war, uh, like sooner than later, and like uh, and, and 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 rebuild Ukraine, which we would like to see. So I think the key idea is that it's grassroots, it's full of creativity, it's full of humor, uh, it 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 it's an attitude which gives us resilience. But so, like from some points, we also saw like some narrative we, narratives and kind of maybe propaganda from the government, but it was like absolutely understandable. For instance, like when they were not tell telling us the real numbers of how many Ukrainian soldiers were killed, just to keep people like, uh, like fight, keep like society like mood to be like, to, to, to feel that we are fighting back. And like, that, that was like, that's absolutely understandable for me. Like, and um, like other example could be I even don't know. Maybe Kiev. this, like, maybe gossip, like, it was also made up uh, from but. people, but like, key propaganda message may, might be like, oh, we believe in armed forces of Ukraine. So it's like, it's not like proactive, it's not against somebody, it's just ideas to mobilize people even more, let them feel this resilience, feel that we are fighting for our values, and it's like, and, and we will win because we will win, because good will prevail. So I think this, like, from this perspective. If I could just jump in, because you've missed a very important meme. I think the most important meme of this war has been the Ukrainian Shut tractor up. dragging yes. Russian tanks. Yes. You this, see this look. <laughs> yes, exactly. I so. got it here. <laughs> this, this meme, as proven, is very influential, but it actually, made, uh, it actually impacted political decisions. Um, it created the impression that the Russian army is extremely incompetent and that the Ukrainian society is fully mobilized, and Ukraine, Ukraine is winning, at least uh, for the beginning, for the first couple of months, that was a very strong impression created by such memes. And in fact, I know, I, I know for a fact that several political leaders in Europe were influenced in continuing or starting to provide weapons to Ukraine because it thought, it realized that Ukraine has a chance to win. If that perception that Ukraine can win had not been created, also through memes like the tractor, then many governments would not have given weapons. So it's, it, it has real life consequences. Absolutely. And so what we're really seeing here take place is the intersection of power, influence, and technology. And the pervasiveness of the, inter, uh, of the internet and of information availability across social media platforms, you name them, nations are figuring out and security services are figuring out as they have for the last several years on how to harness them to achieve their strategic objectives. And the Russians, again, in 2016, trying to interfere with the US election, they caught us by surprise. We didn't necessarily in the intelligence community anticipate their abuse of social media. The, it's all flipped around though. But, and I was personally astonished that the Russians did not take out telecommunications and internet service in Ukraine uh, at, the, at the early stages of the war. We talked about this a little bit yesterday, and I, I don't know why. We'll see. Maybe it was because they thought they were going to be able to take over Kiev in, in two days, and why tear something down only to have to rebuild it? Plus, maybe they were using it anyway for their own communications. But the point is, they gave up an advantage. The Russians gave up an advantage they have, and the Ukrainians immediately took the initiative 
and established the narratives using whether we want to call it propaganda or whatever. So when you talk about the Snake Island issue, you talk about the ghost of Kiev, the Babushka de la Muerta, you talk about the airport that was taken back you know, five different times from uh, the Spetsnaz that were coming in. You, it, it allowed Ukraine to establish their dominance of the information ecosystem and immediately put Russia on the defensive, which then required Russia to respond. And I think we'll probably talk about that in a second. Yeah. One, one thing, just one last thing on, on the technology intersection with uh, with, with content. Uh, I think what has happened is a complete equalization of the uh, technical capability of the citizen versus yeah. the capability of the state in terms of quality of, 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 of a video. And this paired with with the virality of the TikTok uh, environment or the YouTube environment, where something can get very quick uh, um, uh, virality, uh, despite the fact that previously it had no following just depending on, the, on how viral that particular content is. It just means that when you have uh, 100,000 Ukrainians producing quality content, because they can from their phone, and you have literally 50 Russian officers creating their own memes, it's a losing battle for the Russians because yeah. you get so much more viral content from. In the, in the quality, to your point, the quality of the content, but the, it's the broad availability of it. I mean, I could watch Ukrainian drones blowing the tops off Russian tanks all day, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. all day long. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, and you know, just to add here, so like my friend just posted a post on Facebook how she ordered three Starlings. So that's how it's happening. Yeah. So yeah. everyone like just contribute to the resilience of this telecommunication uh, like industry as well. So I think that this like united action was a big, big, big important point. Same time, like a lot of people were preparing, maybe not enough, but for instance, I bought a radio which works without like, without mm -hmm. like electricity, like, and, and uh, yeah, just, I it just so. I wanted, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Russia. You know, Chris, you mentioned the ubiquity of information, but of course, what Russia has been trying to do is, is shut off all access to information other than state propaganda and arguably... Inside uh, Russia. Inside Russia is, yeah, sorry, inside Russia is what I'm talking about. And, you know, arguably the lion's share of Putin's propaganda efforts are directed at his own people to maintain the support. So what are you, Christo, talk a little bit about, um, about what you're seeing about propaganda targeted at the Russian people. How effective is that? It, it is very effective. Russia is uh, essentially a divided society uh, more than ever before. It has a uh, small minority of well-informed people who are not lazy to look out for information despite the time and effort it takes to, to get a VPN, to make sure that you're not caught using a VPN to access illegal information, to make sure you don't share with your neighbors or, or colleagues even what you found out. The, all of these are, are a, a counter uh, well, motivating society to find the truth, but you still have about 20% of society that does that. Then you have 80% of society that are generally lazy, and that's the case in every other society as well, uh, they are uh, deprived of even accidental access to such information, which before they would have gotten through on the way to work by listening to uh, somebody listening to uh, Radio Echo of Moscow or, or watching TV Rain or, or ending up on, on, a, uh, um, on the Insider. All of these are blocked and inaccessible. Twitter is inaccessible. Facebook is inaccessible in Russia. So what you have now is 80% um, a, a of society um, is getting their news from state channels. And state channels, what is interesting here is um, you can create a complete fake reality using real facts. Because during a time of war, you have almost 10,000 times more newsworthy events per day. And if you pick the right ones, you can create a completely false view on what's happening in the war. Uh, and you don't have to even forge facts. You don't have to invent facts. You just have to select, the, um, uh, select them. This is what state media is doing and creating a very emotional picture of hatred to the neo-Nazis. And that is com a complete uh, term deprived of any meeting. Neo-Nazi, as you said, uh, is anybody who, hate, who doesn't want Russia to win, is a neo-Nazi. That, that's the concept, right? So unfortunately, you have a very emotionally invested 80% of the population that are not open to even finding what the truth is. That doesn't mean that that is not going to change, because um, despite the fact that these 80% are not going to suddenly start liking Ukraine or start thinking about the monstrosity of the war and, and, and the human rights violations, they are susceptible to seeing failures to succeed in the war as a sign of weakness of Putin. 
And that is very dangerous for Putin. And if I may adhere just, so what we were doing like with France and some other Aspen fellows during first two weeks of war, so we were organizing media campaigns, engaging celebrities, top bloggers, you know, Instagram bloggers, TikTokers, and trying to reach out to regular Russians just to let them know what's going on and like ask them and motivate them to stood up and like go in against, against the war. Uh, like, and if you have like millions of them protesting, not all of them will be arrested. So it's a different, you know, combination, like understanding all threats. But after two weeks of like attempts, like it led to nothing, nothing at all. And we used like a people, like a celebrities who were very like supported before the war. So, and for us, it was really frustrating experience. It's exactly what was just mentioned, that like they do live in this propaganda. They are not capable to, to hear another story. So just, just, just we gave up, of course. And uh, I think that's, that's very important practical example like how it works and why it's like trying to reach out to, to, to them now, it, it's not working. It's worth just mentioning that what is happening, the, sh the, the complete lockdown of independent journalism in Moscow, I in Russia that has happened in the last few months is unprecedented. Prior to the war, there were, you know, quad there were independent news organizations that were doing, I mean, they were always under threat, but they were operating. And even in the Soviet, I lived in Moscow in the 80s at the height of the Soviet Union. Western journalists were operating pretty freely there and reporting what was going on. Not so today. It is unprecedented. I want to talk a little bit, um, Chris, I want to um, just talk about uh, what we're seeing, um, you know, what the United States role is, particularly right. in the lead up to war and how effective that is. And then how, what we're seeing, I want you to talk a little bit about China and how yeah. that's spreading to other parts of the world. So some of the key differences that I noticed from the U.S. government involvement of this invade, the further invasion of Ukraine, and I compare it to 2016 and even the 2020 election, is that uh, it used to take months and months, if not a year, for the intelligence community to say, look, this is what we're seeing out there, and it's attributed to the, the Kremlin or, or whatever. Um, and then you roll up through 2020, and we got better. You know, there, were, there was one in individual uh, incident with the Iranians where I think we were able to get some intelligence out um, on the order of 27 hours, which is just like lightning speed. It was lightning speed at the time. What we saw happen this go around was the intelligence community getting intelligence on what Russian decision making was on the invasion of Ukraine and start releasing it to the public as early, frankly, as November of 2021. It wasn't just a January thing. It was November, maybe even a little bit earlier. And in some cases, as I understand it, the declassification came within hours, if not an hour or less. So what we've seen is a shift in strategy, at least for this case, of the US leadership that sees sunlight as, you know, Oliver Wendell Holmes, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And I think that is going to be a future tool in the toolkit to counter these asymmetric threats of disinformation, of propaganda, and we will continue to see. Because it is a counter move, is a move, counter move situation. The Russians have changed their tactics, they've developed. Here's the problem though. Everyone else in the world is watching. Everyone in the world is watching. China has changed their tactics on disinformation and propaganda. They used to be a very low key, uh, very low level sort of operator, but uh, there was a great report released by a French think tank last fall that talked about the Russification of Chinese information operations. And you're seeing them become much more aggressive, go after people, go after companies. In fact, just uh, it was yesterday or maybe Tuesday or Monday where uh, the US government and a cyber threat intelligence company Mandiant released a report on Chinese information operators going after Australian and US mining and rare earth companies and besmirching them, reputational harm, saying that they're uh, it, you know, creating environmental harm and things like that. Why, why? It's because they're in the same global market and competing in the rare earth space. So they're trying to tear down their opponents and find a market advantage. It's a much more aggressive technique. It's much broader than they used to be in, in terms of a more focused approach. So I suspect that we will see many more countries out there uh, develop 
these capabilities. Look at how uh, the Russians have done it. Look at how the Chinese have done it. There is a bright spot, though. Like I said, we are changing our tactics and how we're uncovering and disclosing them. But every time you use one of these platforms, social media platforms, or otherwise use the information ecosystem, you have digital exhaust. You leave a trail of bits. And that allows people like Christo to come in and have the exposure operations and call these people out. So it's not hopeless. It is certainly a, uh, quite a mountain or a hill to climb, but we're getting better at understanding and we're getting better also at, as a people of inoculating ourselves against some of these uh, activities. We're, we're about to take your questions. We are quickly running out of time, which is frustrating. But I have one other question I want to direct uh, to, to the two of you, if I could just ask you to answer briefly which is a brief look forward. We know that Russia is, uh, there's been a lot of Russian casualties in the war. Those body bags are going to start to come home, or if not come home, the people, <laughs> the, the lack of body bags, the lack of individuals coming home. Russia is not necessarily sharing that information with the families of the dead. Ukrainians are. How is this going to begin to, how is that going to begin to impact uh, attitudes in Russia, and how can propaganda or information help that? Well, this is the only type of information that can change, potentially, the uh, attitude of Russians to the war. It's not about the lack of humanity. It's, lo it's not about the cruelties performed. Because uh, Russians avoid, like many other nations, they're very uh, adverse to uh, cognitive dissonance. So they, they don't want to uh, even read information that would um, present their, their soldiers in a, in a negative light. Uh, however, um, they are worrying, they're beginning to worry that they may not be winning the war, they, that the, the, the victory is coming at a cost, whatever the victory is going to be defined of, is coming at a cost that was different than the one promised to them, which means many, many more tens of thousands of, of dead soldiers than they anticipated by, the, by Putin calling this a non-war, but a special operation that goes hand in hand with the assumption that it will be about a thousand people at most. Um, but, but then there's also the other side effects of, 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 of perception of a negative outcome, which is the economic situation, the loss of uh, quality of life, and so on and so forth. We're watching the, um, the most frequently asked questions on Russian um, search engines on a daily basis. And what we found is that um, the beginning of the war, the questions were very gung-ho, such as when are we going to be in Kiev, and what, uh, what, what, what can we take over, what, what is the industry of Ukraine, and so on and so forth. So they were thinking about essentially stealing a country. Now these same people are asking questions such as, uh, the top ten questions today are, um, when is Ukraine going to invade Russia? So they are actually worrying about that. How many are the real casualties? What really happened to the cruiser Moscow? What really, um, yeah, what is, where can I buy dollars. Uh, what country still gives Russia st uh, visas to Russians? And the most important question, when are we going to get IKEA back? Yeah. So, <laughs> so this is what's going to change, yes. actually, the attitude to the war. Yeah, it hits home. Just very, like, uh, there is nothing, uh, like, like so, n n nothing to add. It's absolutely true. And just to maybe comment on that, it's like actions, our actions, which matters. So only by experiencing something, I believe this propaganda will a bit like, you know, like fall down. So that's why we need to win. We need to win soon. We need to like rebuild much better, more transparent, more democratic Ukraine. And that would be an example. And that would be a very effective like tool to let them understand what's going on really in this world.